I'm here in my hotel room in Houston, Texas, getting ready to cook the Houston Livestock and Rodeo. I've been brought out to Houston by one of the teams here, a corporate team who once helped cooking the chicken entry. So I'm here to cook chicken at the Houston Livestock and Rodeo 2020. I just got back home after spending some time with the smoke fire, which I ordered from Amazon. And uh, boy, I will tell you that I was surprised by the hornet's nest I stirred up with my first smoke fire real world cook where I cook at my subscriber's home, Dennis, she, uh, and at his home in Redlands, California, about 50 miles from my house. And uh, my smoke fire story actually began in Chicago a few months ago when I was invited for a product launch. Weber invited a few of us YouTubers out there to take a look at a new smoke fire. And I was really impressed by what the Weber engineer said he could do. However, I'm kind of reserving judgment until I actually cook on one. And the goal of my torture test one was actually to stress test the smoke fire by subjecting it to cooking five meats, about 45 pounds in about eight hours. The eight hour duration was actually my estimate as to how long a, somebody could tolerate a stranger in their backyard tearing up their smoke fire. I reckon that I could generate maximum grease in about eight hours from a 16 pound brisket, a 10 pound pork butt at 400 degrees for a few hours and that would basically render a lot of the grease and then set the crust and uh, then put on three St. Louis ribs at 275 degrees and let that drip for another four hours uh, on the smoke fire so a total of about six hours on the first cook. In essence what I was trying to do in torture test one for those of you who saw the video was that I was going to squeeze in a hot and fast cook and a low and slow cook in the shortest amount of time and uh, simulate real world conditions. And after all that grease was accumulated in the first six hours, uh, I planned to actually fire up the pit to 600 degrees to see if I could grill ribeyes and sausages. And then the animal fats, right, that was rendered in the first six hours would likely flash at around 375 to 425. So if there was excessive grease in the unit, uh, it would create a grease flare up or worse still a grease fire. So in other words, the, in torture test one, the 600 degrees was to test uh, it for safety since the unit did receive the Canadian version of the USA UL listing uh, for safety, uh, which is kind of hard to pass, right? Now, for those of you who are aware of the difference between a grease fire and a grease flare up, the grease fire is a major event, the grease flare up is not. So I just want to mention that because I don't think that's widely known. Flare-ups and grease fires are not the same thing because flare-ups are temporary flames that result from the fat dripping onto hot coals or the fat dripping onto hot metal surfaces. And you know that normal part of grilling and not something to that you need to put out. For those of you who see my intro video, you see that huge plume of a grease uh, flare-up. Uh, when I grill my steaks, uh, maybe about you know 12 inches high, that's normal in cooking and that's really what live fire cooking is all about. Whether you cook it low and slow, you cook it hot and fast, or you cook it on the gas grill or an electric grill or a charcoal grill or pellet grill, right? Now, a grease fire, on the other hand, is a different event. It's a major event where a large volume of oil catches on fire. So, Imagine that you have a fry pan on the stove, you're frying chicken, you walk away and you're not aware and the fire is still on. And what happens is then the oil in the pan will ignite. So that's probably about at least two to four cups of oil that will ignite. And then the, uh, it cannot be easily put out, your kitchen will be on fire and likely you have to call 911. Now, um, the same thing can happen in the pit. And uh, you, if that happens in the pit, you will have a fire and it's gonna be really hard to put out. And it's going to need a fire extinguisher uh, or you have to cover the pit and then you may have to call 911. Now, uh, I've experienced several grease fires in my career as a professional pit master. I suspect in the past 12 years, I have had seen, I would say, um, probably three different grease fires. And uh, two were at a contest where teams around me had a grease fire. And you can tell it's a grease fire because the whole pit is billowing with fire and smoke and it's not easy to put out the entire contents of the chamber, cooking chamber, uh, all the meat was ruined. In my case, at the grease fire at home, I was cooking on my gas smoker at home, 
I was dripping uh, oil into a pan. The pan was very close to the fire. And over time, I wasn't paying attention. All of a sudden, the whole thing ignited. I had really, really flames shooting out through the vent. Uh, the only thing I could do was keep the door shut and about 50 pounds of meat was burnt. So that is actually known as a grease fire to be distinguished from a grease flare. All right. So I just want to make sure that, that you are aware of the difference between the two because that will be relevant in this video. Now, most people who saw torture test one saw me cooking in someone's backyard and said it was invalid test because I wrapped the brisket and butt and put it in the oven. Now, for those of you who follow my 240 plus uh, videos and 30 playlists, you have heard me explain many, many times why I wrap the meats. And once you wrap it, you're not going to get any more smoke. No more grease is going to be released into your pit. So at that point in time, BTU is BTU is BTU. And I'm just too cheap to run the meat in my pit because fuel is expensive. I'd rather run that meat in my oven because it does the same job. All you need to do when you reach the fall phase is three things. Moisture, temperature, and time. That's all you need to render the collagen into gelatin. And then when you can do your probe test. Now, uh, in a contest, obviously, you cannot do this. You cannot put this in the oven. But at home, this is kind of what I do. And that's what I did in Dennis's home. So I want to address some of the comments that I received regarding doing that. Now, based on my review and the online buzz on these videos on the smoke fire and posting and so on, I, I've noticed that there's kind of like four types of folks out there kind of evolve, involved in this smoke fire buzz, right? So I'll call the first group, group one. Group one are the people who own smoke fires. They're happy with it. It works. Folks like Dennis. You have group number two, which is people who don't yet own the smoke fire, but they support the people who own smoke fire uh, and have positive experiences and they are the rah-rah people for the group one. The group one actually owns smoke fires and they like it. Group number three are people who own smoke fires and are unhappy with them due to the problems they encounter with the smoke fire. They either return them after a while after trying to fix it uh, or they feel that the problems uh, are intolerable, the problems are insurmountable after spending over $1,200 to buy the unit. And, uh, you know, they try to fix them, do no success, you know, think of the silicone spray and all they complain very loudly online in their videos. And, you know, these people have a right to do that because that's their experience. I believe a lot of these people are very genuine. They're just relaying to you, the audience, just like I am relaying to you, their actual experience with the smoke fire. That takes me now to the group number four. Group number four are people who do not own a smoke fire and are sympathetic to group three because they have agendas out there, such as they are either promoting a kind of a brand they like or they like a particular manufacturer for whatever reason they have, uh, or they sometimes have what I call a love-hate relationship with Weber. On one hand, they love Weber for some of the products. On the other hand, they hate them for some of the other products they don't like. And the smoke fire being a product they may not like because maybe it didn't work according to the way they perceive it to work. And then you have all those people who hate, hate Weber that, you know, they're just haters. They don't like anything to do with Weber because they have another agenda that is unknown, right? Or other combinations, says, as you probably aware, there are a lot of internet trolls out there who do nothing except stir up controversy and generate online fights. And that's what they enjoy doing. More power to those folks. So long as you understand who they are, you can deal with that. Group four often includes what I call the keyboard cooks. Now, the keyboard cooks are folks who kind of surf the internet all day long. They don't really cook. They just cook on the keyboard. They spend 10,000 hours watching videos and then they consider themselves experts or what I call GOTs, Guardians of Tradition. So they wake up in the morning and they tell you you're doing it wrong because I know the right way to do it. I've never cooked, but I watched 10,000 videos therefore I'm really I really know what I'm doing It's equivalent to folks who watch Tiger Woods videos of how Tiger Woods plays golf and then after watching all the videos they consider themselves experts they go on other people's channel and tell people how they're doing golf wrong now the IO can usually sniff these people out pun intended because from the questions they ask me I kind of know they don't cook that's why if you are my student right you will learn that I will admonish you with Harry's three to one rule that means that if you're my student you must cook a minimum of three hours before you're allowed to serve online for one hour. That way, when you cook, you will know. You don't have to believe anybody or anything, including believing me, including watching my videos. So I tell people in life, you want first 
person experiences. You don't want to believe or follow other people or quote the other people or be the recycling mouthpiece for other people's observation. Be your own original, do it yourself, observe yourself, come to your own conclusions. That is how I proceed with my life and that uh, is something that I will show you on my channel. Okay. Now I've been following the uh, gripes about the smoke fire on the internet and they seem to revolve around three main themes. Uh, the first one is the hopper design, not feeding the pellets properly because either the incline is too shallow or there's some kind of design problem and with the auger or the pellets are stuck. So there's cavitation which results in the unit running out of pellets. So that's kind of one generic area. The second is the amount of ash. People are saying, hey, you know, too much ash from a pellet cooker and uh, I'll, I'll address that. And the third is about grease fires. So I've also heard a lot of miscellaneous issues such as uh, faulty controllers. Yes, it's the electronic device you will get bad ones. I deploy uh, IT for a living, and I can tell you when I deploy brand new PCs that are burning in the factory, every 100 machines I deploy, three will fail because that's the normal failure rate, right? So electronic devices, no matter how rigorously you test them, I deploy military spec equipment and 3% will fail. That means three out of 100 will fail every time I deploy. So when I do a large deployment, like three, 4,000 machines, I expect quite a few failures. So that's gonna happen in your unit. If you get one of those bad controllers, then I just feel bad for you. I'm sorry, call Weber and they usually will be able to replace it at no charge. Now, you also have uh, things like uh, calibration. Calibration is a problem in, in the mass produced products. The design can be good, but if the calibration is bad, the parts is not installed properly, you are going to have problems. And of course, this is Weber's first foray into cooking software. And with cooking software and connecting to the phone, there's a whole host of issues that you know, you're gonna encounter. That's why when I cook on a smoke fire, I am just the knob guy. I use the knob and I cook using the knob on, off and set the temperature. So there's a whole host of things that can go wrong with your smoke fire and you know that's part of the manufacturing process so i'm not going to dwell on that my smoke fire arrived from amazon a couple a couple of days ago and i decided to do torture test three because there are three areas that i am interested in you may have other areas you're interested in please conduct your own tests but i was interested in three things right number one that the hopper feeds properly number two is there can be excessive ash on the unit and then the three the possibility of the grease fire Right. So, so test two would involve, uh, in my mind, overloading the unit with meat. Uh, so I decided to load it with about 65, 70 pounds of meat, consisting of two 15 pound prime briskets, two 10 pound pork butts, and two seven pound beef short rib racks. Right? So I loaded up the pit. I would run it overnight before about 225 to 250 for anywhere from 12 to 16 hours. And then to simulate uh, maximum grease, I would cook all the meat from start to end with no wrapping, no butcher paper, no foil, so that I could generate the maximum amount of grease. So, and you see that in my video, amount of grease I generated. Uh, my goal, in essence, right, in this long intro, is to let you watch video number one, let you watch video number two, so you have two data points from me, regardless of whether you belong to group one, the people who own Smoke Fire, Group two, the people who support the people who own smoke fire. Group three, people who own smoke fires are not happy with them, either return them or had really uh, an, an, a very bad experience. And group four, who don't own smoke fire, but support the group three people who don't like the smoke fire. So I made these videos to kind of help you, you know, with knowledge so that you can decide what you want to do, regardless of whether you group one to group four. I really am neutral. I, I'm not affiliated with any of these groups. I just like to cook, spread barbecue love, and I enjoy using equipment because I have a little bit of an engineering background. Now, what you do with these two data points that I have is entirely up to you. My goal is to explain and not defend. Have a conversation with you, not a debate, because a debate signifies somebody wins or somebody loses, right? And the goal of these videos and my channel is to spread barbecue love through education and sharing of ideas so that we can all grow together in the journey of barbecue. And I know that in order to spread barbecue love, we will hit points in the journey where I have to acknowledge that every topic that I talk to you about represents my viewpoint and it can be a three hour kind of argument also a potential Jerry Springer fist fight. So I, I give that to you. So if you want to jump on me and say, hey, you're doing all wrong, that's cool. Let, let's have a conversation. So for those of you who already watch my channel, you know my channel is designed for folks who are eight years old all the way to 88 years old. So I'm happy 
always to have a civil conversation with you on anything I've done on my channel. And I would just ask that you not use any profanity, any kind of personal attacks on me or my friends or any kind of racist remarks. So please don't do that. For those of you who try, you know already what happened. I will delete your comments. And those of you who repeat, you know I will ban you from my channel. So I have no issue doing that at all. But I just want to tell you that I'm more than willing to have a civil conversation with you on any topic on my channel. Now, before I start the video, I, I you should know that, a disclaimer here, I am not on Weber's payroll, I'm not paid by Weber, and I'm not a Weber shield. So for those of you who made those personal comments about me, I just want to stop it right now. You make it again, and I will delete your comment. You make it twice, I will delete you from my channel and ban you. So I'm just very serious about that. I want this channel to be a civil conversation on the journey of barbecue and to spread barbecue love. That's the goal. So if you have that mindset, come to my channel, let's engage in conversation, and you know I respond to every single comment. So if you're here to troll me, I'm going to delete you. So I'm just going to let you have this warning up front. So no hard feelings at all. Now, I purchased this smoke fire with my own money. So the views are my own. Weber didn't pay me to say this. No, nobody paid me to say this. I've spoken to a lot of my buddies on YouTube. They have their opinions. I respect their opinions. I respect their observations and I respect their positions. Similarly, you have to extend me the same courtesy. You have to respect my opinion because when Harry Sue tells you something, I'm telling you from my perspective, you can take it or leave it, that's up to you. And for those of you who want to fast forward through my video and will not bother to watch, so that you can jump to my comments and start to grind your ax with me, I will basically leave you with three spoiler alerts, right? Uh, you know that I read every comment, I respond to every comment. My channel is approaching 100,000 subscribers, which is phenomenal to me. And you know that I really take the time to listen to you, to engage you in conversation, to help you grow in your journey of barbecue and also to help me grow in the barbecue the journey of barbecue because the more i learn about barbecue the more i realize how little i know i hope to learn from you as much as you hope to learn from me so let me give you the spoiler alert before the video starts the answer is yes no and no and let's begin the video hey everybody it's harry from step daddy barbecue the youtube channel that teaches you how to master barbecue so you can spread barbecue love i got a lot of views on my torture test number one for the weber smoke fire brand new pit that just came out in early 2020 i uh, went to my subscribers home dennis uh, in uh, redlands about about 50 miles away from where i live to do a test cook for torture test one because i had not yet received my uh, smoke fire from amazon well, guess what? Uh, my smoke fire is here from Amazon. So today I'm going to do a really torture test number two, test cook, cooking low and slow, watching the grease uh, kind of ooze out from the meat, seeing if we can catch a flare up and also make sure that the pellet hopper works as designed. So in this episode, hopefully I'll address a lot of the questions I received from the first test torture video. So we'll go through the process and teach you guys how we can make six different kinds of meats. Uh, with six different recipes with uh, about 70, 65 to 70 pounds of meat, two briskets, two butts, and two beautiful uh, large uh, beef short ribs. So in this episode, torture test number two, smoke fire coming your way soon. I'm also going to have a debut on my uh, rubs. Uh, I've uh, partnered with uh, the folks at Jealous Devil who have much larger distribution than I do. So for those of you who have been complaining that you cannot find my product in Walmart and grocery stores, uh, hopefully this will this venture will be successful we'll get it into stores like home depot uh true value and a whole bunch of other places so you can get my product instead of having to go on amazon pay a lot of, for shipping on it you can buy it in your local store Okay, we are at 600 degrees for the burning of the uh, run of the uh, Weber smoke fire. Everything seems to be running fine. Assembly took a little longer, so I was just the one person, but uh, everything seems to be running. So we'll let it run about 40 minutes or so at 600 degrees. Run off all the manufacturing residue, and uh, we should be ready to do our first cook.
do the first brisket Texas style, uh, which is basically salt and pepper, heavy on the salt and pepper. Let's uh, start with a little bit of schmear. I'm gonna use a little bit of schmear here. Just a touch of celery seed, just a light coating here. My secret ingredient here, Texas style, the light coating. All right, then we go white pepper, white pepper. All right, get a bit of uh, pe black pepper, heavy, heavy grain black pepper, heavy, uh, rough black pepper. Okay, get some kosher salt now. All right, so that's the uh, Texas style. Let me show you LA style. So the LA style is uh, it's kind of uh, flavors in LA are like kind of garlicky, spicy, and uh, kind of uh, tangy. So I made an LA style rub here. Uh, if you want, I'll, I'll send you the recipe. It's not that hard. It's uh, a little bit of my uh, moolah rub mixed with uh, a lot of garlic, a lot of citric acid, and uh, a, a lot of uh, like garlic powder. So it's garlicky, tangy, spicy, uh, cayenne pepper rub, and that's, I'm gonna call that my LA rub. So we do brisket, Texas style brisket, and LA style brisket. In Los Angeles, we, we have a lot of uh, ethnic groups here, Baha'i, Mexican, Hispanic, Latino, and uh, we like really strong flavors and uh, tangy flavors like Vietnamese, Thai, Cambodian and all are very popular here. So this has a little bit of that kind of a homage. The tanginess, uh, I'm using some citric acid in it. Give it a nice tang. Add a, a little, lots of garlic, a lot of uh, cayenne in it. Give it a little kick and spice. So this is kind of what I call a LA style. Spicy, garlicky, tangy type of rub. And I'm gonna do one brisket that way. So one brisket Texas style, one brisket LA style here. Also very, very good. There's so many, many ways you can cook brisket. And I have at least 30 or 40 different recipes that you cook brisket with. If you guys wanna see more creative recipes, let me know. Uh, you guys saw my episode with the chicken fried brisket. Uh, my episode with the, you know, uh, I have a brisket coming up uh, where I boiled the, the brisket in the crawfish boil before I cooked it on the pit. So I'm pretty crazy, but that's why you come to my channel. So two brisket styles here. Let's move on and uh, do something else with the pork butts. For my pork butt recipe, I've decided to take a homage to the Caribbean. So I uh, made a little uh, Caribbean style jerk pork seasoning. What I did was I took my all-purpose rub here and I added a few Jamaican ingredients, including allspice, uh, a little bit of scotch bonnet pepper for to make it spicy, a little bit of cumin and coriander. And I made myself a little hybrid rub here. I'm gonna call it the uh, Harry's uh, butt, uh, jerk butt rub here. It's gonna be super flavorful. We can do one with the jerk rub, which is a kind of a riff of my all-purpose and added some uh, allspice and scotch bonnet peppers. Gonna Jamaican style man, and I do a little Caribbean pork here, or jerk pork. And uh, for my other pork butt, I'm gonna draw a little bit of inspiration from uh, Latin America. We're gonna make a uh, kind of like adobo chorizo style rub on it. And uh, it's got, uh, I mix this up with, uh, again, I look a little bit all purpose and I took a little bit of my chicken rub. I added some uh, ancho chili. Uh, we have uh, three kinds of chili here. I got ancho chili, pasilla chili, ground. And uh, this is a uh, another version, like a chorizo adobo style, uh, Latin American pork here, porco, porco frito, and uh, take a homage a little bit. So we have two kinds of pork, one Jamaican pork butt, followed by a uh, kind of a, South American or, you know, influenced by Mexican style, chorizo style, adobo pork. So the reason I show you all these recipes is because uh, I am easily bored. I, I cook a lot and I'm always looking for new recipes and always trying to take uh, inspiration from all the flavors around the world. You don't have to look very far to get inspiration and ideas to cook some great barbecue. And if I'm gonna be put torture testing the Whoever smoke fire, I'm gonna might as well have enjoy my pork. Okay, so two kinds of pork, Caribbean pork, and it's kind of like Mexican chorizo pork. Let's move over now over to the beef short rib and show you guys a couple of innovative recipes. For the two beef short ribs, let's go a little crazy around the world. 
let's go ahead and uh, do a Thai influenced uh, short rib and then I'm going to do another one which is a Korean influenced short rib so for those of you who've been to Korea you know that there's something called Kaobi I love Kaobi the, the Korean people really do a good job with their short ribs and uh, what they do is they take a pureed onion with pureed pear put some soy sauce some honey seven up and then make a little soy sauce uh, kind of a uh, a kind of a, a marinade that you put on their meats. Uh, I have some here left over my class. In my class, I, I, when I teach class that we do galbi. I have a recipe that on my website, slapadaddybbq.com, I won a uh, contest uh, for sous vide, sous vide uh, galbi. So I'm gonna just show you guys just how the recipe works here. I'm just gonna spread my Korean galbi marinade on the meat. Ordinarily, I would soak this overnight, but you know, who has time for that? I'm gonna put it on the pit and then get a little bit of this on it. Uh, I have this sauce here I like a lot. It's a bunch of guys from LA. It's called the K-pop uh, sauce. It's uh, kind of a red fermented uh, miso sauce and it's really, really good. It's kind of like a Korean style hot sauce. It's a little bit sweet, a little bit tangy. You can get a little bit of hot sauce on it here. So, so if you ever been to a Korean restaurant and you eat that red, red pork and uh, that wonderful galbi bulgogi, this is an inspiration from that one. So I got a little bit of the K-pop sauce, a little bit of the uh, kalbi marinade that we, I, I'll send the recipe if you're interested. It's on my website actually. Uh, and I finish it with a little bit of a love rub, my little beef mula rub, first place USA. And make this a little Korean influence short. It's gonna be absolutely spicy, a little bit sweet, have a little bit of fermented flavor. Absolutely, absolutely gonna be fantastic. All right, so that's the one short rib here. I'm gonna show you that my next riff is kind of Thailand. Uh, Thai, Thai people like Tom Yum. You can make your and pound your own curry paste, but who has time for that? Uh, I, love, I love curries. I always make Thai style curries. So here's the Tom Yum paste. This is a paste made of uh, lemongrass. It's got uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, some uh, galangang, which is a kind of a ginger. And uh, I'm just gonna mix it up here. A little bit of binder from my uh, sauce here. And we're gonna get it nice and flavorful with a little bit of exotic flavors of lemongrass and um, some galangang, some um, shallots in here, a little bit of tamarind, and uh, something called a kaffir lime leaf. Uh, I have a plant outside my house, I planted it. The kaffir lime leaves gives that wonderful Thai style flavor. If you, you know, have that kind of fragrant lemony flavor that you taste in Thai food, that's where it comes from. I'm just coating it with a little paste of the tong yam. You can make your own, obviously, but too much work. Just buy a jar. It's like three bucks. So I'm putting a little tong yam paste on it. Let me see if we can get a close up look here on the short rib. So, spreading it all out. And ordinarily, I would let this sit overnight before I cook it, but we are in a hurry. I just want to do a torture test. This is not meant to be a cooking episode, it's just meant to be a torture test for equipment, but you know me. I can't resist the temptation to always kind of throw a curveball. So we have, uh, say, so as a recap, I have six uh, different recipes here. Thai style, tom yum, spicy lemongrass, short rib. We have a Korean kalbi style short rib, bulgogi style. This is uh, the uh, LA style brisket with a very heavy, uh, tangy, lemony, garlicky, spicy, salty, peppery brisket and then my homage to good old Texas Tech, my alma mater. Here's the regular Texas style brisket, uh, SBG. And then I've got my uh, Jamaican jerk pork here with the jerk kind of seasoning. And then we've got our uh, chorizo adobo kind of Hispanic style influence here with pasilla chili and a whole bunch of other different uh, ancho chili powder in this rub. So uh, five, six different meats, six different recipes going into the smoke fire and we'll see if the smoke fire can hold up to a long, slow cook. See if we can get the pellet hopper to work smoothly. Also make sure that there's no flare up. I know that a lot of my uh, other uh, YouTube buddies have not had such good experiences, but I will t test it myself because in life you don't want to believe other people. You don't want to read online and try to rehash other people's opinions and observations. You want to have a first person experience. That's why I come to my channel. I'm gonna give you a first person experience cooking on a smoke fire in Harry's Torture Test 2 video episode. We have uh, the smoke fire at 250, running solid 250 here, no problemo. Hopper speeding normally, filled it up. We got uh, six meats in here. The 
Let's see here. If I remember, there's a tom yum short rib, the uh, Texas style, sorry, LA style brisket, spicy, tangy, garlicky. This is the uh, uh, Korean style. That is the uh, pork butt, uh, Caribbean style jerk pork butt. That's the Texas style salt pepper brisket. And then here's the uh, chorizo, uh, chorizo kind of like adobo style pork butt. So you can see, fully loaded, cooking at 250-ish. Do 35 ish all night long and see how long this lasts. Uh, the chute is clean, no problem here. There's no, there's no ash blowing. Unit is running fine, so we'll let it go for about 12 hours and see what happens. Uh, I'm gonna wrap uh, some of them, some are, I'm gonna leave open so we can get a good test of this smoke fire test number two. We're at a one and a half hour mark, everything is still running smoothly. Pellets are still feeding. There is a big uh, cavity, but it's still feeding, so I don't need to do anything yet seems to be working. Meat's drying out really fast. Good airflow. Nice color. It's been about three hours and uh, I'm cooking a lower temperature now because I want to go to sleep and it's coming up to midnight. Everything looks fine. Spray a little bit about three hours later. All look good. No fires. No ash. Drying out nicely, even at low temperature. Alright, I'm gonna go shut it down, go to sleep. It's been about over six hours and uh, the pit is still running nicely at 225. Let's take a look at how things are inside. Get a spray. Everything looks really good. Looks like uh, there's still fuel flowing here. And uh, the hopper is still running here. Let's do a temp check now. at the 12 hour mark is still running smoothly at 225 hopper is almost all gone no problem with the uh, shoot uh, kind of delivering the pellets I did a refuel at six hours so one thing I can say uh, it uh, it seems to work uh, the slope is fine uh, stuff's falling in I have no issues here no uh, cavitation at all uh, temperature seems to be pretty constant not a lot of ash on it. See here, 12 hours later. Let's look at the meats here. I took off the, uh, one of the meats already. One of the ribs was done. Absolutely fantastic, gorgeous. Look at the bark on that. So 12 hours, uh, no no wrap. And let's see here. Oh, look at that. Super duper soft. 
I don't usually show the temperature, but many of you have asked me to show. Let me show temperature to show you guys. It's not about temperature. It's always about the pit master. Never about the pit, not the meat. All right, this is about right. Today is at 192. Ooh, ooh, look at that, super soft. The brisket cooked only on the pit. It's still a little hard. Not quite there yet, this one. Pork butt. Oh yeah, pork butt's done. Uh, the bottom brisket, the Texas one. Ooh, super done. Show you guys the picture is the 196 so not always temperature is a good guy always go with the profile so the bottom brisket is done Let's see here butts are done I have one brisket left that's a little bit tight but I'll let it sit take it off all right let's take a look at the grease pan here and see how much grease there is so that's the amount of grease that we generated overnight and uh, you can tell that uh, the unit has a lot of grease at the bottom here so that's a real cook 65 pounds of meat full grease pan and uh, I have a little bit of grease dripping here that's me cooking 65 pounds of meat I'm not sure everybody will be cooking 12 hours uncovered but this is a torture test right BZ it's a torture test I'm gonna smoke fire and as I take it out here there is just a little bit of a flare up at the bottom I'll show you guys so much grease. It's a little bit on the right side. And uh, I have one brisket at the 12 hour mark. That's a little bit tough, but we're gonna wait a few minutes for it to be done. Uh, so I wanna address this uh, flare up here and the amount of grease so that uh, everybody can understand what this is here. So um, I know people are gonna say, Harry, there is a grease fire. I would submit to you that that is really a kind of a flare-up. Uh, when you cook barbecue, it's common to have animal fat dripping down onto hot surfaces. For those of you who cook offsets, uh, who cook uh, on Weber Smoky Mouth, on kettles, on grills, you guys know that uh, oil will basically burn at around 400 degrees, 375 to 450. So uh, I have an abnormal amount of grease on my pan because uh, my grease is overflowing already. So I have a little bit of a flare up and uh, I don't think that if you cook this at home, it's going to be that big of an issue for you because you're not be cooking so much meat with so much fat, unwrapped, letting everything fit, fit, fit in. I'm going to try to clean the grease trap now and uh, see how much oil that I have. All right, the uh, flare up lasted about, uh, about probably two minutes. And uh, whatever residual grease has burnt off, so no problem there. And uh, my brisket is almost done. So I've got two briskets, two butts, and two sets of short ribs to give a taste test in a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and shut down the smoke fire and uh, proceed to cut, cut the meat up. Show you guys the extent of the smoke ring and the flavor of the meat cooking the smoke fire. All right, let's turn off the puppy here. Home, go down, shut down, press it once, keep power on, shut down, we'll do a shutdown cycle, shut it down. Okay, I'm going through the shutdown cycle now, and you can see that the smoke fire is burning full steam to uh, kind of clean everything up. You can see uh, a pool of grease at the bottom, nothing is burning, there's no flare. So once you have the odd sometimes flare up and it burns away, you'll find the grease is not igniting because for those of you who have ever had a grease fire, you guys know what I'm talking about. What I saw earlier, that is not a grease fire, that's just a flare up. Uh, perhaps a little bit inexperienced uh, for folks who are claiming that there's a grease fire. That's pretty normal. Same thing you get when you grill a steak, you, uh, you're going to see some of that flare up when you grill a steak. Uh, you know, technically you can call that when you grill a steak, the fire is called a grease fire because it's, that's what's burning because it's animal fat that you're burning. But for those of us who have ever had a grease fire, uh, my viewers out there who know what I'm talking about, a grease fire is a horrific event where your entire pit catches on fire, the entire grease pan and all the grease catches fire. You sometimes have to take a fire extinguisher out. So that what I saw earlier was, did not qualify in my book as a grease fire. It's just a flare up. The same flare up you would have when you cook a steak. So it's going through a shutdown cycle. I'm watching it carefully. I want to see how hot it gets because uh, the flames are burning. Uh, I don't see any of the grease at the base. The schedule being ignited. And so 
I'm not seeing any grease fire. So, your mileage will vary. Uh, again, it's all a matter of definition. When you grill a steak and the oil is dripping onto the fire and you have a flare up, you don't call that a grease fire, you call that a great steak. In the smoke fire, what is happening is I have so much oil here and some of the oil is uh, left on the uh, base and the uh, embers are kind of igniting it because it's getting beyond about 375 degrees which is the flash point of oil. Uh, I see more oil down there, it's really really dirty, uh, 65 pounds of meat and I don't see any more fire. So that was just a flare up, so I would not call that a grease fire. If that's just me, you will disagree and that's okay. Uh, this is my experience, your own experience will form your own conclusion. But uh, this is will address, uh, I guess, a lot of the comments I've seen on the internet about people saying that they yeah, have a grease fire. I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, Harry Sue does not think there's a grease fire because uh, I've had a grease fires in my professional cooking career and that does not qualify. That is more of a flare up, the same flare up. I get bigger flare ups when I cook steaks and uh, that is definitely not a grease fire. That's just a flare up from the residual oil. This is a very unusual test because not everybody, everybody's going to cook 65 pounds of meat uncovered in the pit, causing it to drip and beyond the capacity of the drip pan. So I bet, I bet I've exceeded the Weber Engineers design envelope here with the amount of oil I collected. But this is a true test because uh, a grease fire means my whole smoke fire will be on fire and everything will be black, all my meat will be burned. That did not happen. I did have a flare out for some grease at the bottom and that's pretty much about it. So not, not, not a lot of ado about everything, but I know for you, you out there, I'm going to get a lot of flack because you're going to say that that was a grease fire. Same people who will say that uh, grilling a steak, that's not a grease fire, that's called flare up. And that's a delicious steak. So no issue here, I'm going to let it cool down and shut down. Let's go to the shutdown cycle, go taste the meat. All right, let's cut up the meat and uh, do a taste test here. This is the uh, ribs here. How it looks like. So beautiful smoke ring, absolutely gorgeous rib. And uh, let's cut up the brisket now. Do a taste test also. It's not behind the camera here. You have a bite. I'm gonna give beans a bite also in a little bit. Wow, that's good. That's pretty good. Look at that. Juicy gorgeous. Look at that. Oh, look at that. It was all, all right. Dang, it's good. Okay, this one, this one is tong yum. So this is a tong yum one. My son behind the camera here. Little spicy, nice Asian Asian flavor to it. All right, let's do the brisket. So the Texas brisket here. Look at that beautiful smoke ring. Nice crust, unwrapped, completely unwrapped for the total time. You can see here. It's a, and it means the accordion test. That, see that? Look at the bark here. Crazy, crazy dark bark. 12 hours in the smoke fire, uncovered. Do a pull test. Nice, nice, perfect tenderness. Give a taste test to my son behind the camera. Wow. Perfect tenderness. That's crazy good brisket. All right, so that's the brisket. Adobo flavored, but. Oh, I forgot to eat the, uh, let's eat the burn end here. Texas style, we're gonna try to burn in. It's on this end here. Look at that burn in. That's killer burn in right here. See, look at the bark on this thing here. A piece for Brian and me. One for you, one for me. Look at that. Crunch doing good. Let's do the uh, pork butt. Two rice profundi, aka money muscle here. Do a slice of the money muscle. Look at that. Pork rice profundi, money muscle. Uh, this one, I, let me see, one's a jerk, one is the jerk pork. And one is the uh, adobo chorizo pork. I'll try this one. This one must be a jerk. I'll try a jerk one. Jerk one's a little overdone, but that's okay. Look at the bark. Crazy good bark. Please, I know you want some. Give me a minute, okay? You want to try a piece of bread? It's hot, very hot, be careful. Very hot. You got it? Don't burn yourself. All right, it's some good pork. All right, and uh, let's move on to the last biscuit here. This is the, uh, I think, LA style. Uh, Garlicky, spicy, a little bit of citrus in it. A tang from the citric acid. Killer, killer smoke ring, killer bark. Not, not so tender, but this is uh, also on the top shelf. Probably oh, needs another maybe 40 minutes in the pit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Flavor is better. Good flavor. You can get the tanginess. So it's called, I call it LA style. Garlicky, salty, tangy, spicy. 
all six meats perfectly cooked on the smoke fire. Not too strong in the flavor, uh, the smoke flavor, very mild and uh, not overwhelming smoke. I was a little bit worried because I thought 12 hours uncovered would have too much smoke, uh, but they were fantastic. So cooking at 225 seems to be about the uh, smoke fire's sweet spot. Cooking at 225 will not burn the base of your meat, regardless of whether your meat is on the bottom shelf or the top shelf. Just great flavor and uh, a nice amount of smoke. So that's the key. When I cook barbecue, I always worry about too much smoke because a lot of people don't realize that the number one mistake for beginners is they always put too much smoke in their meats. When you cook meat uh, in a kind of a pit like that, uncovered, uh, you, that's why people in Texas use post oak. Post oak has a very mild smoke. You can cook for 12 hours without any problem. Same with pecan. If you cook with some of the heavier woods like hickory, uh, 12 hour smoke on hickory will be disastrous. Uh, even a mesquite is, is just too much smoke. I'm uh, happy to report the smoke fire uh, did not over smoke the meat. Uh, and also probably the type of pellets I used was also a mild pellet. But your mileage will vary. So remember, I only gave you one data point today on this. Uh, episode. I'll uh, recap my conclusions. Uh, I need to get on a plane right now. I'm going to fly to Houston. That's the Houston Livestock and Rodeo. I'm competing in that uh, world championship. I'll summarize this review of my torture test number two when I'm on the plane or I'm in the airport. I need to talk you through some of the things I did, my thought process behind what I did it, uh, and talk about some of the issues I noticed along the way. Uh, I did not see any that was significant. I'll address the issue of the little flare up at the end. Uh, you guys saw the amount of oil I generated at the end of the cook. So I'll address all those issues. But overall, my conclusion is the smoke fire, does it work? The answer is yes. Do you need a little bit of skill to use it? Yes. Is it an automated, autopilot type of pit where you can run it on your phone? No. Can it produce world-class barbecue? The answer is yes. So we'll talk you through the steps. Uh, I think my keep, smoke fire is going to be a keeper. I already have two pellet grills, but I like smoke fire. Uh, it really has a lot of advantages, easy to clean. So I'm going to be talking more about the smoke fire in the weeks to come. Talk you guys kind of through the process. And then after this clip, I'm going to feed Mr. Beans, get on the plane, shoot an outro, and I'm going to address a long litany of all these folks who have been condemning me for actually getting a decent cook out of the smoke fire. We're gonna address your issues one by one and tell you what is and what is not based on my perspective of how barbecue should and should not be. You're gonna get it straight from Harry Sue. Okay, my uh, episode is never complete without Mr. Beans doing his uh, judging here. Are you ready for some uh, barbecue from the smoke fire, Mr. Beans? You ate the one the other day and you seem to like it, right? So, wanna have some more? So let me tell you what is it. We got two samples of uh, short rib you got two samples of brisket and two samples of pork. So six different recipes for you to try. You tell me which one you like first. I'll watch you, okay? Go ahead, go ahead, go. All right, he's checking it out. Oh, he went for the Texas brisket first. And he went for the uh, pork. That was the Thai pork. That was a short rib, I think. Going for another piece of pork. This must be the uh, one from adobo pork. This LA brisket, and then the uh, tom yum ribs. You're just a brisket dog, huh? Your video highlight had a lot of views, so I guess everybody loves you. So you're now known as Beans the Brisket Dog. <laughs>